And we're live. And we're live. Welcome. Welcome to the neurological session from our YouTube channel. Feature guest, Amber Brown. I'll be guiding you. I don't know. It's quiet in here. <laughs> Things are weird. Hi, everybody. We're about to get started on the neurological session. We'll have some people that are joining us live, and then we'll have some people that are going to be watching the video later. So welcome to all the people. Okay. Um, so today is a it's, a it's a session on neuro, obviously. You signed up for it. Um, but we're going to be going over the basics of the neurological system, what the basic nursing plan of care looks like, the basic assessment, diagnostic tools, and things like that. Next week or in the next video, we'll be doing a whole hour just on strokes. So we're going to be doing hemorrhagic versus ischemic stroke, and we're going to be kind of breaking down a little more neurological conditions. So today is your overall perspective of what the neurological system looks like. I would highly encourage you for every single uh, section in nursing school to do it this way, to always start with the patho and the kind of basics of that organ before you start going into the disease processes. Because if you don't understand what the organ does, you definitely are not gonna understand the condition, okay? So today we're gonna start out just talking about what the brain does, what the brain's things are, how we need to fix the brain, how we need to assess the brain, and then our plan of care for all things neurological, okay? All right. So I'm going to be giving you assignments as we kind of, as we go along. So I want you to participate as much as possible, write it down, type it out, however you want to do it, but you need to get moving and engaged in, in the content. All right. So, um, I'm an artist obviously. And so I'm about to draw the world's most terrible brain and human being. Um, so I'm going to start out kind of with that. And I want you guys to tell me as your first assignment, just tell me, what do you know about the brain? Um, and tell me what you kind of know. Oh my God, this is going not well. Look at how big it's headed. Yeah. Hydrocephalus is our number one thing that we're going to learn. Um, <laughs> so I want you guys to tell me what you know about the brain. Okay. Um, what its function is, what it does, how it fits into the scope. Just let me know everything that you know, so that we would have kind of a place to start from. Okay. The neurological system. Now, from the camera view, that brain looks lovely. Oh, it does. It's when I get it closer up that it's not going so good. <laughs> we'll just keep it. Right yes, that's Lord. All right. So, if you kind of we understand sort of what you're what you're starting out with here, then we can kind of go through each section here. All right. So we know that the brain is a big boss of the whole entire body, right? So we've got the brain that's up here and then you're going to have the brain stem. Now I'm not a 3D artist or a regular artist either, um, but you do have a brain stem that goes down this way. It's going to herniate or it's going to go down the back. And then we've got the spinal cord that comes down this way. So the spinal cord's job is to send out electrical impulses to the rest of the body. So the brain is a boss. It tells the spinal cord what electrical impulses to send. And then we have these things called dermatomes, right? And our dermatomes are these lines that the body goes out or that the spinal cord uses in order to send out electrical impulses to different parts of the body. Okay. So we can tell depending on where the, which uh, cervical spine, uh, either cervical, lumbar, whichever one we're talking about, that will send out impulses along these dermatomes. So we know whenever they have an injury on a certain level on the spinal cord, we'll know exactly what kind of part of the body is going to be affected. Okay. So, Let's talk about the components of what's going on up here, all right? So we have three different components here. We've got brain tissue, right? Mm. Yes. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We have cerebral spinal fluid. Yes. Yes, we do. And then we also have blood. Yes. Okay. So those are the three components of what's going on in here, okay? So we have to have brain tissue. That's the actual organ. That's the part of the organ that's actually doing the jobs. We've got the cerebral spinal fluid and it's meant to cushion, to keep things moist, and it's meant to go down into the spinal cord and to do all the things the spinal cord is supposed to do. We just talked about with the electrical impulses, right? So that's kind of the, the, um, the liquid or portion. And then we have blood. Now blood does two things up in here, up in here, up in, it just came out. I couldn't help it. Um, so blood, not only do we have blood inside the brain because it's perfusing the brain tissue. Okay. But we also have, we have blood supply to the brain and then we have blood inside the brain because the brain has a bunch of intricate vessels, lots of arteries, lots of veins. There's a huge blood supply because your brain is ginormous. It's a very big organ compared to most of your other organs. Besides the skin, we know the skin's the biggest. Don't trick uh -huh. me there. I know, somebody was gonna comment and say something. Um, it's a very, very big organ and so it needs a lot of perfusion, right? So there, this is a highly vascular organ. So we have these three components. We've got brain tissue, CSF, and we have blood. 
If any one of these is increased, the other one has to decrease because this makes up 100% of what's going on inside the skull here, okay? So if my brain tissue increases, either my CSF or my blood is gonna have to decrease. Well, what does that mean practically, all right? Let's do it for instance, shall we? We shall. What would be something that would cause my brain tissue to increase? Hint, it's not because you got smarter, okay? Did you? <laughs> I know my jokes are on point today. Um, the brain tissue increasing would usually be an inflammatory condition, either like for meningitis or it could be an injury, some kind of trauma. So let's say um, you have a traumatic brain injury, okay? Mm. Uh -huh. All right, so we had a traumatic brain injury that caused the brain to swell, right? So the actual brain tissue is swelling. That means one of two things is gonna happen. Either the CSF has to decrease, blood has to decrease, or both can decrease. So what I mean by the CSF can decrease, what will happen? Well, we will start to see CSF leaking from the nose or from the ear. If it leaks from the nose, it's called? Rhino. Rhinorrhea, okay. And if it leaks from the ears, it's called? Odoria, okay? So this would be clear liquid fluid that's leaking. So anytime you see on an clear influx, liquid fluid that's leaking. Was it helpful? Did I do a good job? <laughs> I've had too much coffee today. Ah, okay. Um, so rhinorrhea or odoria. So it's going to have to be leaking from somewhere. So it's going to be mm -hmm. leaking from the brain and coming out of one of the holes that it can find, okay? So how do we think of this practically? If you have a patient that's had a traumatic brain injury, and that could be anything from a motor vehicle accident to like they got hit in the head with a baseball bat. Oh, um, got What did you say? Fell off a swing. Oh, fell off a happens. swing. Did that happen to you? Because that's a really very specific kind no, of No, my cord was wrapped around my neck three times. That's what happened. Wow, it is a miracle you are alive. Casey's yeah. with us today. She's a she's another tutor and an awesome thing that she does here. Oh my god. Um, I know you do good things. <laughs> so <laughs> we have rhinorrhea or odoria, and what that will mean is if you have a patient that has a traumatic brain injury, and all of a sudden, watch this because they love to test on this, the patient's like, Ugh, I'm getting a cold. It's really annoying. Can I get a tissue because I have a runny nose? As a nurse, red flag, okay, no, you don't have a cold, you have leaking cerebral spinal fluid, and we have a major problem, all right. all right? They will get something, it's a sign, it's called the what sign? It starts with H when we start leaking CSF. Oh, let me draw. Halo. Halo. Let me see a halo, halo, halo. Okay, so you'll get this bloody stuff that's coming out here, okay? surrounded by a kind of white, clear thing. You'll see this on the pillow. <laughs> I've had <laughs> students come in and be like, where do you see that? Is it like right, how, how would you have a halo right here? How would you see, oh, don't be serious. Word. This is like if they're leaning on the pillow and they're leaking cerebral spinal fluid, it's gonna leak a little bit of blood with it, right? Because the blood is also gonna be coming out. Yes. So you'll get what's called the halo signs when this patient sits up, you'll see on the pillow that there's a circle of clear fluid with a little bit of pink and they call it a halo, like a, Hello, hello. Okay, so if you start to see that there is rhinorrhea or odorrhea after a head trauma, that is a giant red flag. Now, how do I know it's cerebral spinal fluid and they do not, in fact, have just a runny nose? What is glucose? What is, let's test it and do some glucose, okay? So if we see this and there's been a traumatic brain injury, then we are going to do a glucose test. Yes, okay? we are. And I don't mean blood sugar, so y'all don't be running in there and prick this patient's finger and be like, blood sugar looks good, no cerebral spinal fluid. You will be a fool, okay? A what fool. you will do is you take this little piece of paper and you stick it on the little stuff that's coming out of their nose and it will tell you whether they have glucose in it or not. If it is positive for glucose, that is cerebral spinal fluid. If it is negative for glucose, that is snot. It's snot. Snot. And it's snot. <laughs> me today with happiness okay so that's what will happen with the CSF so always be clued into that when your patient has a traumatic brain injury to watch for leakage of cerebral spinal fluid if that tissue is getting swollen okay now the blood also can have to do something and so what may happen is when they get a swelling of the brain tissue it's going to compress the arteries of the veins and then you're not getting good um, cerebral perfusion so usually nursing school exams like to ask you that and they'll say what's the number one sign and symptom for a patient with a traumatic brain injury. Fun fact, always pick this, altered cerebral perfusion, okay? 
And that means that the blood vessels that are up there, the arteries are being compressed because of the swelling of the brain tissue and they're not able to get blood flow. If they don't get blood flow, they don't get oxygen from the hemoglobin, they don't get perfusion and that part of the brain will die which is why your brain is going to find an avenue to escape in order to prevent it from getting increased ICP. So let's go to that. All right, so we talked about the three different components of the brain. If one increases, the other are gonna have to decrease. Let's actually play with this one more time before we go on to ICP. Let's say your patient has a subdural hematoma. So there's a big giant collection of blood. Then what are you gonna see happen to your patient? I'll give you guys a minute to tell me what signs and symptoms you would see and give me what that would look like. All right, so if we had a subdural hematoma, all right, so that would mean that there's a big collection of blood, okay? So let's say that this looks like this. So this whole part right here is just a big giant, basically like a big congealed thing of blood, right? Mm -hmm. That means that that's going to push on my brain tissue. So if the blood is increasing, then the brain tissue is gonna get squished and decreased which means that the CSF is probably gonna start leaking as well because these two are gonna to have to go down, right? So in this patient, you're already gonna to start to see neurological deficits because it's pushing on the brain tissue. Patient's not gonna be getting perfusion. Um, so we get da -da -da -da, altered cerebral perfusion. Now, when I push on the brain, that tells me, ooh, I don't like it because nobody likes to be pushed, right? No. no, they don't. So whenever something is pushing on your brain, then that is going to increase the pressure inside your head, okay? And that is increased ICP. All right, what does ICP stand for? Intracranial pressure, right? So it's the pressure that's going on inside of here. And if we have something pushing, and it, that's going to increase the pressure. So let's talk about what ICP, like why we get so excited about this. All right, we know that if we increase pressure, it's, um, that pressure has got to be released somehow, right? So the inside the skull, your, your body is going to be looking for a way to pop it open and release the pressure, all right? Now in babies, this looks very different because they have open fontanelles and they have sutures that are not fused yet. So if you see like a little, little bitty one and you palpate their head, now make sure you know them first, don't just walk yeah. up to someone at the grocery store and start palpating their sutures, okay? Mm. Um, but if you palpate on the baby's head, you can actually feel ridges because their brains are, their skulls rapidly grow in the first year. So the sutures are kind of like this, and as the brain grows, the sutures will open, and then eventually they will fuse. They also have the big open soft spot in the front and in the back, okay? That allows for room for the brain to grow. However, if they have increased ICP as infants, it also allows a hole for that brain to kind of come through to relieve some of the pressure so that the skull isn't pushing on the brain the entire time. Now, once their fontanelles are closed and once the sutures are fused, now we don't have anywhere for the brain to go. So it's gonna to try to find a spot to go in order to relieve the pressure. The worst case scenario of ICP and why we get so nervous about ICP is because your brain will try to find a spot to go. And what it will do is it will end up going down and herniating into the brainstem. Now we know that the brainstem is the basis of all of our life functions, right? So if we herniate brain tissue down into the brainstem, those are the patients that we say they, it's not really compatible with life. We can keep them on, um, on life support for the rest of their life, but they're never going to be able to have normal um, body functions, right? They're not gonna be able to breathe on their own. They're not gonna be able to think for themselves. None of those things are gonna happen. So our goal for ICP is to prevent brainstem herniation. So we've gotta find a way to fix this problem, all right? So let's talk about ICP and what happens. So if these things start to increase and we're sort of playing this game, doesn't matter which one of these increases, it's going to increase the pressure inside our cranium. It's gonna make the pressure higher because something is there that's not supposed to be there and it's pushing inside the skull, all right? So ICP, let's talk about it. We know that this is increased um, cranial pressure, right? Or intracranial pressure. So what signs and symptoms will we see of increased ICP when the pressure is getting big? Let's use this as an example of the subdural hematoma, okay? 
So tell me what signs and symptoms you will see of increased ICP, and I want you to give me a rationale of why you would see those. You cannot memorize a neuro, okay? So tell me the signs and symptoms and why you would see them. All right, I'm sure you wrote all of them down by now. All right, when you have increased pressure inside the head, how do you think that feels? Hint? Not good. Not good. So they get a pretty massive headache, okay? Anytime you increase pressure on, a, on an organ, chances are it hurts, okay? Now there's increased pressure, and remember your body is trying to find a way to get rid of extra fluid in order to um, normalize the pressure. So these patients will get severe nausea and vomiting, right? Exorcist. Like the exorcist. <laughs> Why? Because the body is rapidly trying to get rid of fluid so that I can decrease the pressure. Less fluid, less pressure, right? This is weird because like whenever you throw up, like it hurts, like, you know? Yeah. Like that would increase. But I feel you like know? your body is really, it's like, it's well-meaning. It's like a sweet grandma. It, it means goes well, and like buys you like... a really terrible looking Christmas sweater. She wants Since you $5 warm. on your birthday. Since you $5 on your birthday. <laughs> like they want, they, they mean well, but then you have to wear this really scary sweater, you know, to Thanksgiving. Well, I ain't worried about it. Yeah. Me, I ain't worried about none. This is our <laughs> soundtrack today. All right, so we have headache, we've got nausea, we've got vomiting, okay? Um, and these are gonna be kind of the early signs, right? Now what happens if I press against the brain tissue? That signals to my brain, oh my gosh, something is wrong, and it's gonna panic. So it's gonna rapidly send off all these electrical impulses, also known as seizures, okay? So you'll get seizures that go along with it. Now, late signs, how do we know that this has gone a little too far, okay? They're gonna get something called um, Cushing's triad, okay? And that's a late sign, and they like to ask that in nursing. So with Cushing's triad, okay, um, they get three things. What are the three components of Cushing's triad? Anybody know? Dun, dun, dun. Widened pulse pressure. And y'all, I went all through nursing school and having no clue what this meant. So I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna tell you today so you don't have to be like me. Bless. Okay. Widened pulse pressure. So that does not mean hypertension, <clears throat> and you will see some resources that say hypertension. Not true. What happens like is Wikipedia. Yeah, don't go on Wikipedia. <laughs> um, let's say we go in at 0900. you're gonna see their blood pressure is 120 over 80. At 10 o'clock in the morning, it's 130 over 70. At 11 o'clock, you go in and it's 140 over 60. Uh -oh. So widened pulse pressure means that there's a bigger difference between the systolic and diastolic. What's the problem with that? I will tell you. Okay, the problem with this is that this pressure goes up really high, so your systolic gets really high. And in a brain that's already injured and swollen, you're gonna blow it out and cause a hemorrhagic stroke. The problem down here is this number keeps getting lower and lower. So the diastolic is so low, it's not able to push with enough force to give us perfusion. So we're either gonna blow out the brain or we're gonna get so little blood flow to where we don't get perfusion. This is a problem, okay? So widened pulse pressure is one of the signs of Cushing's triad, okay? Ooh, I'm not excited about that. <laughs> widened pulse pressure and then we get bradycardia, okay? Anybody know the last one? Irregular respirations. Usually you're gonna see this as Kuzmos, okay? Because what's happening is you're changing the metabolism, metabolism of your body from um, aerobic to anaerobic in order to get enough perfusion. The byproduct of that is lactic acid. You build up acid in the body. Then you're gonna start to get these irregular respirations, which are Kuzmos in order to blow off the acid. So your body is trying to help but it's not doing that good of a job, okay? So these are kind of the signs and symptoms you'll see with increased ICP, and we know that something bad is happening. Now, what is a normal ICP, and when do we get concerned? So give me your levels of what we would expect to see. In nursing school, if you ever have to guess, it's always gonna be one or two numbers, 70 or 20. 
Okay, like if worse comes to worse and you have to guess. And look, ICP, 20. So normal is gonna be zero to 15, okay? Red flag, anything greater than 20 makes us really nervous, okay? Now, once our ICP gets higher and higher, okay, we're gonna start getting nervous because remember our worst case scenario is brainstem herniation and we wanna prevent that from happening, okay? So we're gonna have to do some things to fix this problem. Now, if they have to do something rather emergently, they'll send the patient right into surgery. They're gonna take out a bone flap. So they're actually gonna saw a piece of the cranium, pull it off, and now, just recently in the last couple years, they implant it in the abdomen to give it perfusion. So your skull just lives in your abdomen for a while. Well, and they I'll put this, be. well, I'll be. And they put, <laughs> this is so funny to me, I don't know why. They put this cheesecloth looking thing over their brain because literally when they lay over to the side, it's just completely exposed brain where they pulled that thing out. It's a very big deal. So there's just like a little cheesecloth thingy over it and that gives it or allows the brain to have some extra room in order to swell until we can fix the swelling and fix the injury and that way they won't herniate down into the brain stem, okay? So how would I diagnose ICP? Well, I'll tell you, there is an ICP monitor. Isn't that nice? Okay. So nice. Yeah. So there's an actual ICP monitor and we're going to put it into the brain. No big deal. Okay. Oh. Um, <laughs> so we're going to do an ICP monitoring system and those are for patients that really need it. Now, when we go and do the bone flap, we can put that in at the same time too, if we need to. Okay. Um, it's like one of those meat thermometers, like for steak. Um, I'm going to say not it's exactly, <laughs> but it actually is sort of close to that. It is, it drills it in is, yeah. and then it has an external monitoring system that you can, that you can watch the ICP. Like All right. So tell me, knowing what you know so far, what would my treatment look like for this increased ICP? So we've got to get the swelling down. We've got to get the fluid volume down, um, and fix the problem so we can fix, right? And while you guys are telling me what the treatment is, I want to go over here to perfusion really quick. The best indicator or one of the best things that we can do to make sure that they're getting perfusion is to look at the map. Not okay. of America. Not of America. And to be honest, I went all through nursing school. I heard this a million times and the concept was so foreign that I was like, I don't, I can't understand what you're talking about. So we're going to learn it today. All right. So the map is your mean arterial pressure. Your artery's responsibility is to get blood flow to the brain and to, you know, whatever organ. Here we're talking about the brain, obviously. So mean arterial pressure, mean means the average, so it's the average pressure in the arteries. You need a certain amount of pressure in order to maintain cerebral perfusion. So the pressure has to be enough in order to make sure that the arteries are able to deliver that oxygenated blood to my brain tissue. So your map needs to be somewhere around, what I tell you? Nursing school, pick 20 or 70. 70, 70. okay. So the map needs to be around 70. Ideally, I mean, the, the lowest case, we want to keep it over 65. And that tells me 65 that to survive. 65 to survive. I don't know why we got British, but we did. So is. map is, needs to be around 70, um, or at least greater than 65 would be the minimum. That tells me I have just enough pressure in order to maintain perfusion. Anything less than that, my pressure is not enough to maintain cerebral perfusion. What would I do to increase my map if it was too low? We could give fluids or we could give pressors. And remember, you're always going to give fluids before pressors. My vasopressors are like your epinephrine. Um, you can give uh, dopamine, okay? So what you'll see here is that we want to do things. We have to fill up the vessel first and then squeeze it because your pressors are going to squeeze, press, right? So we want to fill up the vessel first. So you're always going to do fluids first and then pressors next. I developed a lisp. I don't know why. I just, it happened. It's fitting everywhere. So that's a really big fun fact, and they love to test on this in neuro, so that's something that you need to understand. All right, so what's my treatment going to look like? Well, if this is a swelling or brain tissue problem or a bleeding problem or a too much fluid problem, all right, then I typically am going to give some corticosteroids, and that's going to decrease the swelling, right? Yep. Then I need to give something that's going to get rid of the fluid, and the best way to get rid of fluid from the brain is to give... An osmotic diuretic such as mannitol. How do you know all the answers? So she doesn't smart. even have an outline. What? Yeah. This what? is Ivy League trained right That's here. Right. Okay. So you're gonna give corticosteroids, you're gonna give mannitol. What mannitol does is it pulls fluid off of the brain down this way. Okay. So 
I'm going to decrease the swelling, decrease the fluid. Hopefully that will increase my MAP, give me a good enough MAP to maintain cerebral perfusion so that I have blood flow, my CSF will drain beautifully, my brain tissue goes back to normal, I can replace the bone flap, we can now be a productive member of society and say we healed from a traumatic brain injury. That's ideally how this happens. Now let's talk nursing care because the nursing care for ICP, they love to ask questions on this, okay? So I have increased, increased, you see what I'm saying? Too much coffee. Increased intracranial pressure, too much pressure inside the brain. Part of the nursing care is to make sure you don't increase the pressure further, right? So what are things that your patient could do that would increase their ICP, not meaning to, but it just would, and things we want to avoid? Pooping. Casey said pooping. Okay, so we would like to bowel avoid- Bowel movement, if you will. Stringing with the bowel movement, okay? Now, how do I avoid having them strain with the bowel movement? Give them some stool softeners. Give them some stool softeners. And you will see that in select all that apply questions all the time. And nobody picks it because they're like, what does pooping have to do with your brain? Fun fact, a lot, okay? So we want to administer a stool softener because we don't want them to strain. What are some other things that could increase ICP? Sneezing. Sneezing, okay. So we want them to avoid straining, sneezing. Coughing. Coughing. Vomiting. Oh, I know. Oh. Careful of if they have increased ICP is trach suction, and they love to ask questions on this too. So we only want to. We, I'm going to put avoid suctioning, but use your common sense because if they can't breathe, we have to clear the airway. Okay. They but you only. Blood. Yeah. They only want to suction if you absolutely have to to clear the airway. Other than that, do not suction routinely, which you shouldn't do anyway. Be very cautious with suctioning in a patient with increased ICP because it will increase their ICP further, okay? So we're gonna administer soul softeners. So what kind of environment do we wanna place these patients in? So we don't wanna increase pressure. We want it dim, quiet. Dim lights, quiet environment. And this is pretty much for all your newer patients, right? Put them in a cave. That's where I'd wanna be. I mean, I kinda of wanna be in one right now, right? And just be chilling in a cool cave, yeah. doing my cave thing. Quiet environment, how do we position our patient when they have something wrong with their brain? Remember we want everything to drain, okay? So we want the CSF to drain, we don't wanna build up an extra fluid. So you are gonna sit the patient upright. The biggest thing that we like to focus on is not even the position, but the head. Head needs to be midline, okay? If I'm like this, if I'm like this, if I'm like this, I'm not gonna be able to drain fluid very well. So we need to put the head midline. The only exception for this rule is in pediatrics. If you've ever tried to force a child to have their head midline, <laughs> it's not gonna happen, okay? Position so, for position for comfort in children and adults that can listen to you and do what you say, um, we want their head to be midline, okay? Another thing to be really cautious of, especially if we have brain swelling, is to change positions slowly for the patient. Now, the patient's not getting up out of bed if they have increased ICP. This is for you change the patient slowly as far as positions, even if you're bathing, if you're turning. The reason being, it's not a um, orthostatic hypotension thing, it's not that, okay? What it is is the brain is swollen, so it kind of sticks to the inside of the cranium. Mm. So if I have the patient upright like this, right? Or let's say, yeah, let's say I've got them upright like this. No, let's put them down. So they're like this, right? And their brain is swollen and stuck to the inside of the cranium. And then I'm like, okay, we need to set them upright because we gonna make sure they're oxygenating well. And I do like this. What happens is when that brain was stuck to the back of the cranium and I went like this, it's gonna shear the back of the brain and cause a big giant bleed in the back of the brain. We kind of want to prevent that because we're already going through some things, okay? So it will cause brain shearing. So make sure that you change positions for your patient very slowly, okay? All right, so we're on stool softeners. We've got this quiet environment. Now, anytime I get stuck on my nursing care, I always want to go back to my signs and symptoms. They've got a pretty bad headache, okay? So I'm probably going to give them some analgesics. Be cautious giving them something that's going, going to alter their mental status. So you don't want to give them a ton of fentanyl. You don't want to give them a ton of morphine because then you won't be able to tell if their level of consciousness is getting worse or if they're just having a really nice time on the morphine. This is my purpose. Yeah, that could be it too, okay? All right, we don't want them to vomit, so I need to give them some. If you said anti-emetics, you would be correct, okay? Um, we don't want them to seize. That probably would cause a little increased ICP too, so we're going to give them anti-seizure medications, right? Yep. Anti-epileptics, 
if you will. Some might say. Some might say, okay. Um, we're probably gonna put them on some seizure precautions, are we not? We shall. What's included in seizure precautions for your neuro patient? Padded bed rails. Padded bed rails. Bed low. Bed, bed low. low. Locked position. Oxygen should be at the bedside. Suction should be at the bedside. You should have checked those and make sure that they're working correctly before you start shift, okay? Let's talk about seizure activity really quickly because there's lots of questions that they'll like to ask on exams about your role in seizures, okay? So in our patients that have seizure disorders, right, most of the time they have an aura first, um, like they know, they kind of have this feeling something is coming. Some people see things, some people hear things, some people smell things, some people just get a taste feeling, things. taste things, okay? Um, they get a feeling, hey, the seizure is coming. If your patient is out of bed and they are about to have a seizure, they start having a seizure. You want to ease them down to the ground, right? Turn them kind of onto their side, put a pillow underneath their head to pad their head because we don't want them hitting their head. So your biggest goal at that point is to prevent injury, okay? Loosen the gown to make sure it's not gonna them, okay? You turn them to the side because there, there are two things that can happen during a seizure that you have to look out for. One is aspiration, right? They produce a lot of saliva during these seizure activities and so we want to kind of put them on the side so that we can drain that out a little bit. We have the suction there, so if we need to suction out their mouth, we can do that while they're having the seizure, okay? So you need a nice clear airway. The second thing that can happen is they can get hypoxic during the seizure. So you need to have an SpO2 monitor on your patient and you need to watch for signs and symptoms of hypoxia or cyanosis. They start to turn blue, your SpO2 starts to go down. And in that case, we're gonna give them blow by oxygen. A lot of people don't know what blow by means or what that is. Um, think of how hard it would be if your patient is sneezing to try to put a face mask on them or to try to put a nasal cannula on. Like that's Ooh. not okay, it would be very difficult. So what we do is we take the AMBU bag, we pop off the bottom of the AMBU bag, we turn on the oxygen as high as we can go, and we just do a whole bunch of high flow oxygen kind of directed at their face or blow it by their face. Oh. Blow by, okay? So that's kind of what you're gonna do during the seizure. Your biggest job is one, to make sure the patient's free of injury, two, to make sure they're free of aspiration, three, to make sure they're not hypoxic, four is to record everything that you see. So you need to time the seizure. You need to see um, like how long that they've been seizing and what the seizing looks like because you're gonna have to document that later. If the seizure activity goes more than five minutes, we're gonna call it status epilepticus and we're gonna need to treat them with something. Reason being, you've got all this rapid electrical activity going through the brain and it can basically fry your brain out, so you have to stop that activity. Does anybody know what the two drug of choice, drugs of choice, drugs of choice are for status epilepticus that you slam IV push in order to get them to stop seizing? If you said Ativan and Valium, you would be correct, <laughs> all right? So we've got Ativan and Valium, and those are typically the two drug of choice that we'll treat for status epilepticus, okay? All right, after your patient has had the seizure, it's your responsibility to document everything. It is very common for them to have this post-ictal phase afterwards where they're just exhausted, okay? I bet they are. They, they are exhausted. Their marathon. muscles have been going like crazy. Now, big things to watch for after the seizure. Now, the postictal is normal, and they're gonna wanna sleep, and that's okay. A lot of students are scared to choose that on the exam, like let them sleep, because they think it's like a concussion where you have to wake them up, but you don't. Your brain is so tired, and we just let them sleep, so you turn them in a recovery position where they're on the side, we're not aspirating, and you let them sleep. A lot of times if they have like a tonic-clonic seizure, the really bad seizures, their muscles can be very fatigued and very sore, so we may need to provide an analgesic at that point, okay? Um, there's something else they like to ask about for seizure afterwards, and let me think about what it is. Oh, Todd's paralysis. So there's something called Todd's paralysis where some of the muscles are gonna get a little bit paralyzed. It usually lasts about 24 hours, and it, usually you're gonna see it more affected on the face. Um, it will come back, and unlike Bell's palsy, which usually lasts for weeks or months at a time, Todd's paralysis typically lasts about 24 hours. Give it some time and it'll just go away on its own. Your muscles are tired. The other big red flag you have to watch for after seizure activity, especially like a tonic-clonic seizure, because those are the worst, um, would be something like um, rhabdomyolysis, all right? So if their muscles are going like crazy and they're moving and they're tightening, that causes muscle damage, all right? When your muscles are damaged, your muscles are gonna release two different things. One, lactic acid, two, myoglobin all right now myoglobin is a byproduct of muscle breakdown and it's not dangerous in and of itself 
The part that becomes dangerous is when the myoglobin tries to get excreted through the kidneys because it's got to get out of here. Oh, that's a bad kidney. And that's okay. You can get one <laughs> This one has gone through some things. It has. Okay, this is an atrophied kidney. At least you um, knew exactly when you drew it. I did. Bad. So you've got these big, giant myoglobin molecules that are trying to pass through these very small glomeruli. And so what they do is they try to pass through here as they kind of rip open the glomeruli. We don't like to rip open things in the kidney. It's an mm -hmm. organ. We try not to rip it. But when that happens... Um, you'll look down at their urine bag and you'll see their urine is just bright red because all that myoglobin, not only is the myoglobin red molecules, but it's also destroying the kidney on the way out. So there are some patients that can end up going into kidney failure after a really bad seizure because of this. So we need to push fluids, we need to watch the kidney functions, or BUN and creatinine, and you need to watch urine output and the color of the urine to make sure that we're not having this issue. I eat? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this increased ICP, a lot of this is just kind of basic nursing care for a neurological patient, okay? Um, we are going to go over all things stroke next week, so I'm going to skip over stroke. I want to just kind of talk about the different neurological assessments I would do on this patient if I was the nurse, all right? So we're going to come over here and we're going to talk about neuro assessment and what those look like. So I feel like a lot of people kind of get these wrong and they don't really understand what the neuro assessment is and what it looks like. So I want you guys to list out as many different neurological assessments as you can think of, how you perform those, and what they test, okay? And we're going to go through a focused neurological assessment for our patient with increased ICP. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to do that. All right, you guys have one more minute and then we're gonna start hitting the neuro assessment. we talk about the neurological assessments, the last thing that we're going to talk about is signs and symptoms of brain death. Mm. It's kind of a morbid way to end it, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But I want to write this, I don't, I don't forget that we need to come back and do that so you understand. It's not enough to just understand, obviously, what the brain does. You have to understand the signs and symptoms that you're given and then be able to apply what that means to your patient, okay? So if we're talking about our different neurological assessments, let me use a different color. Um, the biggest and easiest one that we can do is just a mini mental status exam, okay? Um, and what's included in a mini mental status exam? So this is just kind of seeing, hey, is the patient alert and oriented, okay? Do they know who they are? Do they know where they are? Do they know why they're here, all right? 
So this is basically you're gonna ask them their name, do you know where you are, what day it is, is it today? So this is just kind of getting an idea of, are you okay? All right, because we perform a mini mental status exam on even like our psych patients, just to see how cognizant are we, how there are you. Um, and so the result of this would be A and O times three, alert and oriented times three, and that's how you would document it on your nursing chart. Do not document that if it is not possible to assess that. Okay. Oh, they, I hate if they are so knocked much. out, unable to assess. Throw that. You on can there. always say <laughs> unable to assess. But God, this was such a pet peeve of mine when I taught. I would get to these nursing students who would write these documentation, and I walked in there, and their patient's going through some things. Like, they're on a bend, and they are knocked out to China and back, and they are not moving. They're on a sedative. They're on a paralytic. Like, nothing's going anywhere. And I get this. I'm like, Is really? You walked into Mr. Jones, and he woke up for just a minute to tell you, I'm doing fine today, Barbara. Thank you. And then went back to sleep. That's Hashtag a no -go. Lazarus? Yeah. <laughs> So do not write A and O times three if they are not A and O times three. So if I ever get a nursing student, if I'm in the hospital, I straight up am gonna give them something to talk about. I agree, <laughs> I agree. So this is just looking to see, a really min mini mental status exam just tells us really quickly what the patient's neurological status is. Alert noise times three is what we're looking for. Okay, next thing that we can do very, very quickly is just to assess quickly the level of consciousness, okay? How now, are we doing it? Excuse me? Is it quickly? Quickly, do it fast. You this is what we call like these things <laughs> quickly fast all of these things that i'm going to talk about are going to be in your like your quick primary survey all right in your primary survey it's basically like a head to toe let me make sure that you are alive and then we're going to start going through the vitals and doing all those things so these are like quick and easy things you can do very fast quickly 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 and, and fast okay oh, so assess your level of consciousness what are some different level of consciousness that we could document Anybody? Oh, uh, this is what happens when you get a helper to help you with the video <laughs> and they stuff their mouth full of candy when you're asking for some additional support. Mm -hmm. All right, so we could be, we're alert, right? We're happy, mm -hmm. we're moving around, okay? Um, they could be, um, we don't really write confused. You'll see people chart that, but it, that's pretty subjective to say that the patient is totally confused, right? I mean, I'm confused with life sometimes. Most of the time I am. So I feel like that's a pretty subjective word to use, so we would try to kind of avoid that. Um, we could use the word lethargic. What does lethargic mean? I don't think it means what you think it means. Not easily awoken. Not easily awoken. So what you'll get is patients that will call, or a, a sibling or a parent or something that calls, my, my child's lethargic, and you hear them in the background. Bah, 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 bah. Okay, that is not lethargic. Lethargic literally means it is difficult to wake that patient up, okay? If your child is running around like a crazy person or just sleepy, lethargic does not mean sleepy. Lethargic means you're so altered that it is hard for me to wake you up, okay? One time I star rubbed this guy so hard it like almost ripped his skin off and he oh. still was not waking up. So that's probably lethargic. worse than lethargic, <laughs> okay? Because then we get to a point where we're like obtuse. I like this word. I mean, that's like, it ain't nothing happening, right? Like, we're trying to, like, kind of do anything to you. Yes, yeah, a sternal rub may make you, like, a little, do a little something, but not much. Then you're going to go into a stupor. Ooh. We've all been there. <laughs> not all. <laughs> um, we go into a stupor. That's like, you're not waking up very well at all. Like, I've tried all the different things. I'm trying to sternal rub you. Like, not a whole lot is happening with you. I'm talking to you. There's no response. None of these things are happening. So we need to assess level of consciousness and we need to kind of get like a baseline and what that looks like so that way I know if we are declining, okay? The next thing we wanna do is something called a Glasgow Coma Scale, all right? This is, should be a quick and easy, quick, quick and easy way to assess neurological status. I want you guys to tell me what you know about the Glasgow Coma Scale. Here's your assignment. I want you to tell me what the possible scores are, low to high, what the three components are of the Glasgow Coma Scale and how we score them. And you guys will have a up close picture of this if you can't read my beautiful tiny handwriting that I could write on rice. All right, Glasgow Coma Scale. 
it is going to test you on or test the patient on three different components: their eye-opening response, motor response, verbal response. Okay, those are the three components. So are they just opening their eyes whenever you come in, or do I have to like do a song and a dance in order to get you to open your eyes? I will do a song and a dance at the end. <laughs> Um, their best motor response. So are they, um, when you hold their hand, will they just squeeze or will they just only withdraw from pain? Um, best verbal response. Are they able to say their name or do you have to do another song and dance to get them to go, mm, and cheer for you? Um, so those are the three different components. Each one of these is going to give you a minimal score of one. So our bottom score is three. Um, our highest score is 15. So the lower your number, the worse you are neurologically. Okay, less than eight. Intubate. Intubate. So if you get a Glasgow coma so close to eight, realize their brain is so not doing okay that you're, it probably can't even maintain respiratory status at that point, and we need to intubate the patient. Okay, so that's something you definitely need to remember. Less than eight, intubate. Okay, anything below 15 is considered altered. So unless they have a 15, okay, then we're not doing incredibly hot. But the lower the number, of course, the worse they are, and less than eight, we're going to anticipate intubation, okay? Do not pick to intubate on the exam because you can't intubate. You're gonna pick that you would anticipate that and get the intubation kit ready, okay? So you just assess respiratory status at this point because probably we're not doing all that well. All right, um, other thing, oh, this is a great one. I love this one, pupillary response. All right, people get this all kind of jacked up. And I did too when I was in nursing school. Now that I'm looking back, there's so many things I thought I understood, but I, <laughs> I don't know how we're not saying this. I'm not really sure. Um, so the pupillary response. So people think, or I'm sorry, some people like I did thought that this had something to do with vision or like somehow that we're seeing. It does not. This has to do with your straight up neurological response. Your pupils are connected to the optic nerve, which is connected to your brain. So this is a brain response to your pupils, okay? So what's a normal pupillary response? What do we want them to have? Pearl. Oh, here's another pet peeve. Here we go, here we go, <laughs> come on, come on. Okay, so we have something called Perla. okay? Pupils e equal responsive and reactive to light and accommodation. So that means that whenever I flash the light, the pupils are going to constrict, okay? They are also, when I, the light goes away, they're gonna open. And then in order to test the A or the accommodation, you have the patient focus on something far away, and then you put a pin up here and tell them to focus here, and you should see pupillary constriction so that I can focus. That is accommodation. If your patient is a little bitty child, if your patient is totally knocked out on a vent, do not write Perla, because how did you get them to accommodate? I ask. Your six month old sitting there and say, sir, I need you to focus on the, it doesn't happen, okay? So make sure you're charting appropriately and using Perla. If the patient is able to follow those instructions then you're actually able to assess it. Pearl, and let it in there, if you're not able to do so, okay? So a normal pupillary response would be that the pupils are gonna constrict. You look at the pupil size first, make sure that they're responsive to light which means that they're gonna constrict when light comes and open back up whenever the, you take the light away. They should be equal, right? So we wanna make sure that they are um, reacting at the same size and the actual pupils just without light are at the same size, yes? What happens if you have one big pupil and one little pupil? Ooh, something wrong has happened. If you have one big and one small, that means that one of them is attached and working beautifully. That means that the other one is not attached and working beautifully, okay? So that means, typically means that there's a bleed on one side. You either have a subdural hematoma, an epidural, something is happening inside the brain, usually a bleed. That means that one side is affected and the other one isn't, okay? So that's part, people are responsive. If you have one big and one little, that's usually a bleed. If your pupils are fixed and dilated, what does that mean? Okay. Fixed means they're, they're not doing anything, they're just open. Dilated means they are nice and open and they're not gonna to respond to light. That means that there is not a connection to the optic nerve to the brain, so we're missing a connection. That typically means that we have had a brainstem herniation and we're not, no longer responsive, which doesn't mean the patient is blind. I have had so many students say that. No, 
it means that their brain is not intact. It's not working correctly. Either we've herniated or the swelling has become so severe. We have increased ICP. It's compressing the optic nerve. Something is happening to where it's not, it's not working correctly. That is a sign of not the only sign. Now, if you're going to go into a family and say, hey, these are uh, your, your um, family member is brain dead, okay, there's no brain activity, you would need to have multiple different assessments in order for that to happen, okay? Um, because if we're considering taking somebody off of life support, we would have to be absolutely sure. So we know that fixed and dilated pupils are a sign, okay? All right, I want you guys to give me as many signs of brain death or tests that you do. There's a lot of these tests, okay? It doesn't necessarily mean I'm not looking for like increased ICP. That's not a sign of brain death. I'm talking about tests or exams that you actually do that will show that the patient is brain dead. So I want you to write down as many of those as you can think of and how you perform those. All right, you guys got it? All right, so we said fixed and dilated pupils are a bad sign. All right, what about posturing? What do you guys know about posturing? That's where the patient is either going to posture this way or we posture this way, but their arms are stuck in that position. So there's not brain activity that's telling and firing off neuron, neuron activity um, and electrical activity in order to do what my body wants it to do. So we either have decorticate posturing or decerebrate posturing. That is a sign of brain death. So if you come in and your patient is permanently kind of postured that way, that could be a sign of brain death. We also have something called a cold caloric test, okay? The cold caloric test is a test that we perform, all right? And so what we do is we take a 30 ml uh, syringe and we pull up cold water and you're gonna flush their ear with cold water, which sounds really mean. I know, that doesn't sound nice. Um, a normal response is what we call COWS. C-O-W-S, it's a good um, acronym for you to use. So if we're using cold water, their eyes are gonna deviate to the opposite side. If we're using warm water, they should deviate to the same side. So let's talk about that for a second. So you can either do cold or warm, either way. Usually we do cold, that's why it's called the cold caloric. Hmm. So a normal <laughs> response, this is a normal response and they're usually gonna get nystagmus plus cows, okay? What is nystagmus? Where their eye, she's doing it and she's doing it really good but it's not cute. <laughs> so where your eyes are, right? So I remember n -n nystagmus n -n -n never stops moving. So their eyes are gonna get kinda, kinda crazy, okay? So a normal response would be, let's say if, if you guys were going to do it to me today, you pull 30 cc's of cold water and you put it in my ear, my eyes are going to start doing this. And then since it's cold, my eyes are then going to deviate to the opposite side of the ear that I put it in. If you do warm water in this ear, it's going to be the same thing, nystagmus, but it's going to go, my eyes are going to deviate over to the same side. That's a good test. That's a normal response. That means your brain is intact. So if they do not have a cow's response, which means there's usually, if it's their brain dead, there's no response. There's no nystagmus, there's no nothing. It's just nothing, okay? Why are you laughing at me? Because I said nothing. She's hateful. Okay, so in the cold caloric test, normal is nystagmus plus cows, abnormal would be no response. That would be a sign of brain death. Now what is the exam that we do, the actual, um, the brainwave scan that we do on the brain, brainwave scan that we do on the brain, um, in order to see if they have any activity going on? Hint? It's an EEG, okay? So the EEG is like an EKG for the brain. So we're looking to see if there's any brain activity. They'll do an EEG and they'll see what is called cerebral silence or they'll see silence on the EEG, meaning the brain is not responding at all. There's no electrical activity going on. The patient is only surviving because they're on life support, okay? Be careful with some of those EEG machines because while they're recording, like with the leads, they also have a video camera that's recording now too. Videoing you. No, videoing the patient so it but sees. But you're in it. Yeah, so if you talk, then they know. Yeah. So be mindful. Indeed. 
All right, so we've got fixed and dilated pupils, posturing, the cold caloric test. We've got the EEG. The last one I want to talk about is the doll's eye reflex. I put it last because it's kind of creepy. Okay. When you are looking at your patient, all right, think of if like my eyes and my muscles and my eyes are intact and I say like, oh, turn your head over to the left and I turn, my eye muscles and everything is still intact in order to keep my eyes this way, right? So I can still look at you when I turn my head because my brain's intact. Patients that have brain death, when you turn their head, they will just do this. Oh. <laughs> I know, okay? So that means that there's no muscle, there's no, like, there's nothing communicating, so their eyes are just gonna follow wherever you turn them because nothing is keeping in that way, okay? So think of it like like a Barbie doll. If you turn a Barbie doll's head, she's not gonna be looking at you still, unless there's something wrong oh, no, with that Barbie doll. <laughs> All right, so that's a doll's eye reflex. And so if you see that, then that typically means we're not doing very well. Uh, speaking of reflex, the other thing that you may see when they're not doing well neurologically would be the Babinski, okay? So they'd have a positive Babinski. Babinski is where you take the bottom of their foot, you stroke down the bottom of their foot, and their big toe is gonna dorsiflex, and the rest of the toes are gonna fan. That is a neonatal response or a neonatal reflex. So in babies up until age six months, or actually up until nine to 12 months, they can have a positive Babinski and that's normal because they're babies and they have these neonatal reflexes. Now we lose that reflex around nine to 12 months. And so as an adult, if we start to see that neonatal or premature reflex again, that's gonna lead us to believe we're not doing very well, okay? So you would have a mixture of several of these different um, tests. The only other one I wanna add up here, it's another diagnostic, is the cerebral perfusion test. And that's a test we actually look for to see what the blood flow looks like and we can see what areas of the brain are getting blood flow and what areas are not getting blood flow, okay? So you would have to have a bunch of different tests in order to go up to your patient and to say, you know, the patient's family and say, hey, look, we did the EEG, there's just silence on it, the doll's eye reflex is there, um, they have a positive Babinski, we've done the cold caloric test and there was no response. Um, they're obviously just laying in bed posturing, pupils are fixed and dilated. All of these things together lead me to believe that we're not doing incredibly well. Um, and so those would, all of those together could contribute and we could say, hey, maybe it's time to talk about organ donation. Maybe it's time to talk about taking off life support whenever you're ready to do so, okay? All right, so if we look back at neuro and everything that we talked about, all right, we talked about the different components of the neurological system. We talked about how those give and take and big things that you need to look for in your patient, okay? We talked about ICP and how that plays a big part here, what those signs and symptoms in the nursing plan of care looks like. Okay? And you can use this nursing plan of care for almost every single neurological thing. All right? We talked about the different focused neuroassessments that you could use on your patient and then how we would know if the patient's brain is not doing very well. All right? um, so that's kind of the basics of what the neurological system looks like. We could go into 50,000 more of these, which we probably will. And then next week we're going to go into the full plan of care for strokes. So we're going to do everything from beginning to end. So you definitely want to check out that video too. Um, but these are the basics of what you need to know and understand. If you can understand these basics, there's so many questions that we could build just off of the basics of the neurological system here. If you guys have any questions, definitely post it. Let us know what those are going to look like. Uh, we can post some practice questions for you for Neuro 2 so you can kind of get um, and synthesize some of the things that you've learned today. All right. Um, so if you have any questions, let us know, and we will see you next week for Stroke. Later.